Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. My name is Kenneth Whitwer, and I'll be your host this, uh, this evening, this morning, depending on where you are around the globe. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our, uh, our, our, our speakers today. So we have the Charles Lai Lab uh, presenting. And so I'm going to hand this over to, uh, to Charles Lai in just a second. Um, and he's going to give an introduction and also um, introduce the speaker from his lab. So without any further talk from me, let's hand this over to Charles. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Ken, for again, hosting this um, the second time for us. But as I was just discussing with Ken, that I really, really am grateful for him to host this EV club for everybody to help us carry through our research uh, during the um, pandemic time. So let's begin with our talk. So again, uh, my name is Charles Lai from Academia Seneca in Taiwan, and this is my student, uh, Brian McGolan. So I thought it's, you know, the time of the season that uh, is quite festive. Eh? So I brought this uh, Christmas tree and I thought this is usually when you start telling a little bit of stories. And this is a story of big and small EVs. So how did this story came about was uh, when I attended the 2017 ICEF annual meeting in Toronto, Canada. And this is the convention center, as you can see. And if you're Canadian like me who grew up there, not in Toronto, but I grew up in Vancouver, that this is our Canadian spirit, the Tim Hortons, that we love our coffee. Um, for North American friends on the East Coast, this is your Dunkin's that you have to uh, drink. But for my European friends, this is the ditch water coffee that you will call. But uh, there were many great speakers. Uh, to this day, they're still very active. Uh, this includes my mentor, uh, Dr. Zandra Brakefield, where I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship. And to this day, I'm still very grateful for her tutelage. Um, that allowed me to become uh, the scientist that I am today. So thank you again, Sandra. And uh, I was uh, very honored to co-host um, a Meet the Expert session with Dr. Takahiro Ochiya from Japan at that time. And this is indeed the same slide that I put on uh, during that session. And the title was In Vivo Imaging and Vesicle Biological Activity. And I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but this again is a 2017 version. Things were so much easier or simpler back then, or we thought that vesicles are considered, consisted of these sizes, but we now know that they are also particles, for example, supermeres and exomeres. And uh, this was something that I mentioned is that a lot of people are trying to study vesicles in vivo uh, through imaging. And these are just a couple um, major model people have used, including C. elegans, mice, zebrafish, and macaque. And coincidentally, after five years, all everybody have made landmark uh, study in all, by using all these model organisms and also study their biological activity. Now, interestingly, I was able to show a video uh, which I published under Dr. Sandra Brakefield, uh, Dr. Sandra Brakefield, that we imaged vesicle uh, release from EL4 thymoma label with a reporter that we created called Palm GFP. Now, this is done through collaboration with Dr. Torsten Mampo. Uh, essentially, what we did is uh, by using two photon imaging to image uh, um, cancer implanted in the dorsal skin, we were able to see the release of vesicles from these cancer cells all alive in the animals. And you can see that these vesicles come in different sizes. Again, these are not super resolution, but you can see that these vesicles come in different sizes. And I think it was a great opportunity that uh, we were chatting and discussing with the audiences. And if my memory served me correctly, I mentioned a couple messages. One is that I don't believe the cells would rely just on one vesicle subtype to communicate in vivo. The other thing that we, or I mentioned, is that I don't think dyes are evil, quote unquote, but we need to know their properties to use them correctly. And so the journey begins. And without further ado, I would like to introduce my student again, Brian McGowan, who spearheaded this project on the big and small EVs. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian, and I'm a PhD student, again, with uh, Dr. Charles Lai, uh, and working in Academia Seneca here in Taiwan. So I'm delighted to share with you today some of our research uh, findings about big and small EVs, particularly the labeling, dosage, and size-dependent by distribution and function of the specific subtypes of EVs. Um, let me tell you, uh, uh, I know everyone's a, an expert in this field, but let me tell you a brief uh, introduction first of uh, about extracellular vesicles or otherwise known as EVs. So EVs are nano-sized vesicles with a lipid bilayer released by cells as a form of cell-to-cell -cell communication. Now, however, in uh, the same way, 
uh, the Z cells could also use this platform to deliver cargoes uh, to other normal cells to promote disease progression. Now, in the past decades, um, many studies have identified that cells release multiple types of EVs and not just exosomes. For example, um, small EVs or exosomes here uh, range from 50 to 200 nanometers, while microvesicles could go up to one micron in size. On the other hand, other researchers have also introduced the, the presence of uh, non-membranous non particles such as exomeres or supermeres, which have been found to carry the stained cargo signatures. And uh, also, specific aggressive cancer types have been observed to uh, release large oncosomes that could go up to 10 micrometers. They also contain uh, oncoproteins which can mediate disease progression. And recently, other types of vesicles such as microsomes have also been noted. Now, this only tells us that cells produce a lot of uh, EVs that interplay during disease progressions or other functions in the body. Now, for this work, however, I'd like to clarify that unlike microvesicles or exosomes, we term the big EVs as EVs bigger than 200 nanometers, while SEVs as EVs smaller than 200 nanometers, particularly because um, in this work, we did not um, identify the subcellular origins of these types of EVs. Now, breast cancer is still the leading cause of death among women worldwide. And um, according to the presence or absence of biomarkers, breast cancers can be categorized as either luminal, HER2 positive, or triple negative breast cancers. And among these uh, subtypes, the triple negative Breast cancers, otherwise known as TNBC, exhibits the worst prognosis primarily because of the absence of biomarkers, which allows it to be diagnosed and treated early on stage. While EVs have been identified to participate in EV uh, breast cancer diseases, it is still unknown whether uh, they favor the release of a specific EV subtype. And more importantly, whether these populations exhibit a tumorigenic property is also still largely unexplored. And hence, uh, our project began. And in order to answer or explore this question, we isolated uh, big and small EVs from human TNBC, ERPR positive, and HER2 positive uh, breast cancer cell lines, and compared them with EVs isolated from the normal human memory epithelial cells M10. We collected conditioned media from all the cell lines and performed a differential centrifugation uh, with the following steps. So the first step was uh, mainly a clarification step wherein we centrifuge a 300G and 2000G to separate the dead cells and the cell debris uh, respectively. And then this was followed by a 20,000G centrifugation in order to afford the big EVs. Now, the subsequent supernatant were then uh, centrifuged again for 100,000 G spin to be able to afford the small EVs. Now, these big EVs or uh, ENDS SEVs were uh, sub subsequently purified using PBS washing. We then performed nanoparticle tracking analysis, otherwise known as NTA, um, on the isolated BEVs and SEVs. And what we found was that in TNBC and ERPR positive breast cancer cell lines, the amounts of BEVs and SEVs released per cell was considered to be comparable. Now, this was in contrast what we found with the normal M10 cell line, as well as the other cell lines, such as SKBR3, which is a HER2 positive breast cancer, wherein um, they release a significantly higher amount of exosome compared to BEVs. Of interest, once we normalized the uh, BEVs per SEVs released by cells, we found that triple negative breast cancer cell lines, along with the ER positive uh, cell lines, 
uh, they released a significantly higher amount of BEVs per SEV as compared to the M10 control. Now, this was a surprising new finding for our lab, and the high BEV per SEV ratio of the aggressive TNBC cells uh, actually suggested that while SEVs have been reported to enhance carcinogenesis, BEVs may also play an important role during tumor progression via circulation and distribution in vivo. And hence, this warranted for a further exploration in order to solidify this finding. Now, with that finding, we then investigated the TNPC secreted BEVs and SEVs and used the TNBC resembling 41 cancer cell line as a syngenaic immunocompetent breast tumor model. We then performed a TM analysis of the isolated BEVs and SEVs and found that the mean sizes of uh, isolated BEVs roughly was about 295 nanometers. And on the other hand, SEVs had a mean size of uh, 110 nanometers. So this was done by um, image analysis of about 30 images, TEM images, and uh, analysis of about 400 uh, particles uh, for uh, BEV and SEV respectively. Now, we did further investigation on the distribution of the particles within the isolated BEVs and SEVs and found that BEVs were actually consisted largely of 200 to 1,000 nanometer sized particles. On the other hand, SEVs were found to be significantly composed of uh, particles which range from one to 200 nanometer uh, sized particles. Now this finding suggested that the isolated BEVs and SEVs were distinct EV populations with varied particle distributions. So I think with uh, the recent years or decades, it's always been a problem of how to efficiently perform pharmacokinetics and biodistribution analysis in vivo. Now, those and um, EV signal are always the critical factors that control EV pharmacokinetics and biodistribution experiments. Commonly, when the labeled EVs um, give off signal which are very low or poor, a high amount of EV dose is usually used in order to be able to detect the EV signals in animals. However, this high amounts of um, amounts of EVs may not necessarily uh, uh, correspond to a physiologically relevant EV dose, and at some point may also impose lethality to the animals. Hence, it is always uh, a crucial. Um, a part of the experiment to find a very efficient EV uh, labeling tool that could work about these uh, hindrances. One of the common um, EV labeling tool uh, commercially available is the lipophilic dyes. So lipophilic dyes work by insertion into the lipid bilayer of the cells or the EVs. Now, some of the dyes available in uh, commercially include the PKH26, DID, and the DIR. However, this, uh, most of these commercial dyes have been found to uh, exhibit high background noise and form nano-sized micelles, as well as exhibit a long half-life, which some of which could go up to 100 days, which is not physiologically uh, uh, applicable when you're studying the biodistribution of your EVs. Now, this limits the in vivo applicability of most dyes, and hence um, other labeling techniques may become um, more efficient when, depending on the types of experiment uh, that you're going to perform. Now, in order to circumvent some of the caveats with the uh, commonly used uh, EV markers or labeling tools, we developed Pongrat and uh, in such a way that it is, enables the EV membrane labeling and the inner leaflet of the cells via its palmitylation moiety. So as you can see here, the palmitylation moiety allows for the reporter to insert into the inner leaflet of the cell and thereby uh, gets attached and gets released uh, as the EVs gets formed by the cells. Now, upon reaction with the substrate fluorofluorimazine, 
the bioluminescent NLUG protein uh, emits a signal which then um, excites the nearby GFP protein and gives off a signal which can be detected by IVIS and allows for a multi-resolution imaging for both in vivo and uh, up to a cellular and e even an EV levels. So this results with signals with low background noise. And actually this has been all, uh, already published and uh, we were able to explore uh, how this reporter uh, is mostly applicable for whole animal testing up to organs, tissues, cells, up to EV levels of uh, resolution. So we next compared um, EVs isolated from wall type, and then 41 labeled with pomegranate, and then with pomegranate labeled EVs, we then dye labeled with either PKH26, DID, and DIR in order to investigate whether the EV labeling tool would actually alter EV sizes. Because as we know, it is important that the labeling tool does not alter the EV uh, size and uh, including the mean size and particle distribution. So in here, our findings suggested that, oh, let me explain this first. I think it's a very complicated uh, figure. So the black part represents uh, the wall type. The red represents 41 labeled with just pomegranate and all the dashed line, uh, regardless of color are the ones that are labeled with uh, the dyes, such as PKH uh, 26, DID and DIR. So as you can see here, um, the black and the red lines uh, coincide with, uh, with each other, um, suggesting that the pomegranate labeling did not um, alter the by distribu uh, distribution properties of uh, the EVs. Uh, however, it can be uh, seen here that all the dashed lines have been shifted slightly to the right, indicating that there was a change in particle distribution, specifically an increase in size. Now, a similar trend was found with SEVs, um, in which the uh, pomegranate retained the bi-distribution properties of the EVs, while the dye-labeled ones have exhibited uh, a shift towards a larger particle size distribution. We then further analyzed the particle um, distribution between specific uh, size ranges, particularly from one to 100 up to 501 to 1000 uh, nanometer size ranges. And what we found, interestingly, when we compared to the wall type, um, palm grad BVs and SEVs, uh, distribution profiles did not vary significantly in all the size ranges that we explored. Now, this suggested that pomegranate labeling retained the original particle size heterogeneity in both BEVs and SEVs, which is very important for uh, labeling tools uh, to do. Now, on the other hand, when uh, we explored the the EVs, uh, BEVs and SEVs labeled with the dyes, we observed uh, an overall altered EV bi distribution pattern. And specifically, we saw that for BEVs, there was a decrease in 101 to 200 nanometer sized uh, particles, followed by a subsequent increase in the 200 up to 500 nanometer sized particles. Now this suggested that uh, a possible uh, explanation is that the, uh, the original 100 to 200 nanometer size particles after labeled with the dye could have increased in size and, there, and thereby shifted to a larger uh, EV, uh, EV size uh, division. Next, um, we compared the detection limits and linearity between the palm grad and the Die R signals in 41 pomegranate, die R BEVs and SEVs. Now, again, to clarify, uh, the EVs used in these experiments were labeled uh, initially with pomegranate and then labeled with die R, thereby exhibiting both the pomegranate properties as well as the die R properties. Now, pomegranate signals were detected with a very high correlation um, with protein concentration for both BEV and SEV. Now, on the other hand, the DIR signals demonstrated a lower correlation, specifically at the very low, do, uh, very low amounts of proteins 
um, thereby uh, showing a very uh, low dynamic range for di R signals. Now, these findings indicated that palm grad exhibit a large or high dynamic range and linearity, which would be able to allow a better ED pro, uh, protein uh, comparison when applied uh, in vitro and hopefully in vivo. So I'd like to tell a short story about this uh, experiment. Now, this experiment was initially aimed to investigate the possible effect of EV dose on the EV by distribution. And hence, for this experiment, we IV administered uh, 10, 25, 50, up to 100 microgram, uh, 41 palm grad uh, di R BEVs or SEVs into bulb C mice. Now, take note that um, the 100 microgram um, is a well reported dose for most. Uh, EV experiments, which used dye labeling in their experiments. Uh, and I think um, this was because of the limitation with a signal um, exhibited by dyes, uh, uh, especially in vivo uh, experiments. However, once we performed this experiment, we un uh, serendipitously, I would say, uh, observed a high lethality rate um, and uh, unexpectedly in both the 50 and 100 uh, microgram injected animals for both BEVs and SEVs. Now, uh, by contrast, we found that uh, animals injected with 10 microgram and 25 micro, uh, microgram of BEVs and SEVs were able to virtually survive 24 hours post-injection. Now, this result indicated that possibly 50 microgram or more doses of BV and SEV could impose a high lethality risk to animals. Now, this is without saying that um, there are other factors which have contributed to this result. But we'd like to clarify that uh, we've previously administered up to 100 microgram of EVs in, uh, derived from HEG293T uh, palm grat uh, cells. Now these are normal cells and was also injected to animals. Um, this goes to show, uh, we didn't actually observe any animal death then. And hence this goes to show that the lethality risk could be uh, interplay of several factors, including the cell type or even the dose uh, uh, dependency of the injection. And hence um, this is a result and we just imply um, that in doing uh, dosages, in, especially in by distribution analysis, um, factors such as uh, cell dependency and dose should be um, prioritized or explored prior to the investigation itself. Now, since that unfortunate, uh, oh, well, actually serendipitous finding, we then performed by distribution analysis on the surviving animals, uh, specifically on the 10 microgram and the 25 microgram injected uh, animals. And then what we found um, interestingly was that this uh, palm grass signal revealed um, that EVs uh, primarily target the lung, the liver, and the spleen uh, at low dosages of uh, 10 micrograms. So even a 10 microgram uh, dose, we were able to find a bi-distribution profile as reflected by palm grass signal. Now, these signals uh, have uh, changed after 24 hours post-injection, um, revealing that palm grass signal is able to give off a, uh, a time point uh, dependent change uh, once injected into animals. Now, compared to the DIR signals, what we found interestingly is compared to palm grat, most of the signals from di R were only detected in the liver, both for uh, 0 0.5 hours and 24 hours post-injection. Now, this may mislead other people, but what we uh, would like to emphasize is that since the di R signals we detected was uh, not that high, it was only uh, in the liver that we could get a signal with enough uh, robustness and intensity, and thereby, once we analyzed the whole or systemic organ by distribution, it was only delivered or reflected a higher percentage and may not reflect the entire systemic by distribution profile of the EVs that we injected. Now, 
of interest, if we were to compare the 10 microgram VEV to the 25 microgram VEV, we found that um, palm grad could be able to reflect a dose dependent uh, biodistribution profile in such a way that using 25 microgram dose, we were able to see that um, more BEVs actually went to the lungs as compared when only 10 microgram injection was performed. Now, this was not uh, observed again with the die R signals of the EVs that we injected. And uh, we found a similar and consistent trend with SEVs, thereby suggesting that the signals were uh, reflective of the EV by distribution. Um, and one inter interesting found uh, finding that we saw uh, between the difference of BEVs and SEVs is that SEVs also tend to go to the long uh, spleen rather more compared to BEVs. Now, to investigate the proteins uh, that may contribute to 41 EV organotropism, we then performed a proteomics analysis of 41 BEVs and SEV. And we further screened for prior association with breast cancer, uh, either tumor genesis or metastasis. So we screened for several candidates and we uh, further identified uh, three top candidates which have had like a uh, long tropism um, annotations, specifically the SLC29A1, um, tet tetraspanin CD9, as well as your uh, glycoprotein CD44. Um, after proteomics analysis, we uh, performed a knockdown of these uh, candidate proteins in 41 palm cells in order to perform subsequent experiments in vivo. So upon validation of the knockdown of CD9, CD44, and SLC29A1 in both BEV and SEVs, we then proceeded to perform biodistribution uh, analysis uh, of the knockdown protein candidates in both BEVs and SEVs uh, using a ball see mice model. So we administered primarily 10 microgram of scramble uh, or the knockdown uh, BEVs or SEVs and administered a zero, 24 hour, 48 hour, up to 72 hours uh, and collected the mice organs and blood for subsequent analysis. Now, the data that I'll be presenting is uh, quite large. So bear with me if I um, um, go with you on this uh, presentation. So what we found interestingly is that after injection of uh, scramble and uh, SHCD9 uh, BEVs, uh, we didn't see any particular differences between the biodistribution uh, as we did with our previous experiments. Now, however, after 72.5 hours post-injection, um, we found that the, the amounts of BVs that went to the lungs actually significantly decrease compared to the scramble control. Now, this suggested that CD9 depletion in the BEVs could have a slower mode of action, which can only be seen uh, when a, a consistent amount of BEVs is injected to the animals. Now, we then analyzed the ones that have been injected with a CD44 knockdown or SLC29A1 knockdown BEVs. And compared to S, uh, CD19, uh, CD9 knockdown, we found that there was an immediate decrease in the amount of EVs that went to the lung as compared to the scramble. And hence this uh, phenotype was also observed even after 72 hours. Now this suggested the CD44 or SLC29A1 uh, depletion in BEVs could have both an immediate and sustained effect on the uh, reduction of amount of EVs going towards the lung. Now, uh, remarkably, uh, we, we found that with knocking down CD9, CD44 and SLC29A1 in BEVs also resulted to an increased amount of EVs going towards the blood circulation. Now, we hypothesized that since the uptake of these EVs uh, were greatly reduced 
uh, by the major organs, the availability of these EVs were actually increased in circulation or uh, possibly uh, going towards the other organs as well, which we may call as the redirected tropism. Now, a similar finding or trend or pattern was found in small EVs. But uh, we'd like to also show that th we found a distinct, uh, distinct difference between the bi-distribution profiles of big EVs and SEVs. Particularly, as we saw earlier, we found that consistently the SEVs had an initial high uptake in the spleen as compared to the big EVs. And by knocking down CD9, CD44, and SLC29A1, the amount of SEVs that went to the spleen were significantly reduced as well. And this finding was consistent even after 72 hours post preliminary injection. Next is uh, to investigate if constant exposure to cancer BEVs and SEVs would actually exhibit a protumergenic function. We performed a syngenaic immunocompetent mice uh, tumor model uh, experiment. So a syngenaic immunocompetent tumor bearing mice were administered uh, with 41 pomegranate scramble uh, or SH CD44 BEVs and or SEVs. So we administered this three times per week for up to 18 days and then collected the organs, tumor and blood for subsequent ana uh, analysis of the EVs. Scramble BEVs and SEV groups yielded a significantly uh, higher tumor volume as compared to the PBS control. Now, on the other hand, we found out that uh, after depleting CD44 in BEVs and SEVs, the tumor volumes were actually uh, comparable to the PBS control. Now, this suggested that depletion of CD44 in EVs attenuated the protumergenic potential of 41 EVs. Now, this finding was further supported by immunohistochemistry analysis, in which we found that depletion of CD44 for both BEV and SEV actually decreased the amount of delivery of EVs in the organs. And a similar trend was found in SEVs. So the biodistribution analysis was also performed. And what we found was that the tumor bearing mice had a distinct uh, distribution profiles for both scramble and SHCD44 EVs. Specifically, we observed that compared to the scramble control, which is a very long tropic, knocking down uh, CD44 in both BV and SEV actually resulted to a decreased lung organotropism or rather by distribution and thereby also increased uh, amounts going to the blood circulation. This finding was um, primarily supported by, again, IHC analysis of the lung sections, wherein we found that when we depleted um, CD44 for both BEV and SEVs, the amount of EVs that went into the scramble controls were actually increased in the knockdown uh, groups, suggesting that um, CD44 do play a role in the uptake of BVs and SEVs into uh, primary organs such as the lungs. So um, this ends my presentation, but I'd like to summarize the key findings of our uh, uh, results. So in summary, we show that aggressive TNBC uh, cancer cells uh, release a significantly higher amount of BEVs per SEV than normal cells. Um, interestingly, systemic characterization revealed that TNBC-derived BEVs and SEVs both exhibited a distinct different particle size distribution, composition, and bi-distribution profiles. And more importantly, Despite these differences, both BEVs and SEVs demonstrated similar degrees of tropism towards the tumor and thereby inducing protumergenic effects among, upon long-term in vivo treatment. Now, both of the 
uh, tropism to the tumor and proteomergenic potential was revealed to be depleted along with the depletion of CD44 in this uh, big and small EVs. Now, overall, with the EV uh, general perspective, our work provides a evidence on the equally significant role of BEVs in vivo, particularly in experiments uh, of diseases. And as we know, both BEVs and SEVs, along with possibly other types of EVs, uh, interplay during disease progression. And hence, we propose that studying or elucidating their biodistribution profiles and understanding how they may potentially uh, control disease development is highly important. Moreover, this work also identified possible opportunities to explore both EV-mediated diagnosis and hopefully therapeutics as well. And with this, I would like to thank everyone um, who have been part of this work and especially our lab members, as well as our collaborators from Academia Seneca and National Tsinghua University in Shinchu, and especially our, our, our funding institutions. So I'd like to give my mic to again, uh, Charles for further. So finally, I'd like to also encourage everybody to attend the upcoming uh, ICEP annual meeting in Seattle. And as you can see that this story actually derived from the 2017 meeting. So again, I will highly encourage everybody to attend. And also our lab continues to recruit talents. So if you're interested in our lab, which we develop and create new technologies to explore biological phenomena, if you're interested, please uh, give us a shout. And uh, finally, uh, Brian and I would like to thank you for your attention uh, to listen to us. I know to some people it's pretty late. But uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to entertain and share with you. Thank you. Well, that's a fantastic opportunity to do some exciting work. So um, if you're looking for a position, please send in your application. And um, I, um, I see that we have quite a few questions that have come in in the chat box already. Um, but I will Great. be calling on you. So if you put your, your comment or your question there, I will call your name. And then you're welcome to uh, turn on your mic or turn on your camera. Um, or both, um, and you can interact with our presenters. So um, I would like to just start with a, a question of my own, though, um, because you you know that different different labs use different um, measurements to define their doses. Um, so your your microgram doses, do you do you have an idea of what what sort of particle counts those corresponded to? I'll give this to Brian. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it's a long debate whether uh, how to normalize with either like particle size or protein concentration, but we did uh, particle counting of our uh, EVs, and then we found that for BEV, uh, 10 microgram usually corresponds to about like 10 to the uh, 8 particles, whereas for SEVs, it's usually uh, about like 10 to the nine number of particles. So there's a difference between the number of particles, but we tend to normalize with the amount of uh, protein concentration, mainly because we found that normalizing with protein concentration re uh, resulted to a uh, slightly comparable um, reporter signal, which we uh, thought would uh, actually mitigate possible bi uh, biases when we do the in vivo experience uh, later on. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And of course, particle count too, it's going to depend on which uh, platform is being used and the sensitivity of the platform. So, and of course, <laughs> the purity too of the vesicles. So yes. yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, all right, so let's go to the chat box now. And uh, we have our first question from Vidyanan Sasudaran. Um, Vidyanan, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Uh, so I was quite curious, like when you said initially uh, that the, you found a difference between uh, the BEV uh, population secreted by different kinds of cancer cell types. So uh, when you say BEVs, you have oncosomes and aporotic bodies along with mm -hmm. your measurement, right? And it's yes. only thing like the more virulent your cancer uh, cell line is, the more they're going to secrete these. Um, yes. So I think that was the initial um, uh, premise is that like possibly breast cancers or any other types of disease uh, cells would uh, likely uh, release a higher amounts. However, in the research, uh, researches that we found was that 
um, there weren't a lot of research that actually tackled whether the these increased um, amounts of uh, EVs were actually specifically either big or small EVs, which was really a good uh, area to tackle since um, there are several types of EVs, again, and they both interplay and you know, finding the, the types of EVs that actually increase during disease progression is very important. Now, however, uh, in this work, uh, I know that there are uh, other types such as large oncosomes, but in this work, we only focused on the big EVs, which were afforded from the 20K centrifugation and the small EVs, which were afforded with the 100K centrifugation. Now, LOs or large oncosomes have been identified in specific uh, uh, types of cancer cells, maybe possibly uh, prostate cancers. And usually those uh, EVs were uh, isolated using the 2000G centrifugation. So for this part, we did not uh, particularly uh, use the LOs or study the LOs. We had only uh, identified the big and the small EVs. And if I may add, okay. oh. like, uh, yeah, like a lot of uh, researchers, including us, like we used to apply filter. And I think this is something that uh, we learn uh, serendip serendipitously that when we don't apply the filter, we actually start seeing other size vesicles that we often missed. So I think this is something for us to consider. And this goes into the vesicle isolation protocols, um, which was just heavily discussed at the uh, past uh, ICEF-X tech meeting in Hawaii. So again, I think there's something to consider as well as to how you isolate them. Yeah. Perfect. I have one more question, and that's uh, regarding uh, the conditional knockdown of tetraspanins and other proteins you mentioned. So you said you uh, you were able to knock down uh, tetraspanins and SLC protein in BEV. Mm -hmm. So how do you conditionally knock them down? Oh, so we basically um, used uh, shRNAs. So we stably expressed uh, the shRNAs in uh, the 41 pomegranate cells using uh, lentivirus transduction. And then we um, confirmed the knockdown using uh, RTQPCR. So it's basically a global knockdown of the particular span in, in SEVs and BEVs. It's not specific to BEVs. Yes, yes. So oh, we okay. knocked down Sorry, the proteins in the cells and then isolated oh, okay. BEV and SEVs. Okay, so when you said you believe in, I, I got confused. Sorry, thank you. Great work. Thank you. One second. thank you so much. Thanks for the questions, Anand. Uh, let's go to Taral, Taral Lunabat. Um, you have a couple of questions here, so you're welcome to ask them both. Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, hi, Charles. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Sandra Baker's lab. So, uh, yeah, hi. I the first snow. Yeah, yeah, it was like a couple of days back. So, uh, all right, so it's a great work. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is regarding the um, injection of your BEVs and SEVs. Uh, did you inject it retroorbitally or with tailwind injections? And did you find any differences in the lethality if you uh, tried mm -hmm. with both the injections? Yes. Well, again, like this is a very good question, and we are getting asked about this quite frequently. But for for this work, we only focused on IV administration, so we injected uh, through tail vein injection. Now, um, we believe that uh, this route would actually mimic uh, more of the circulation, since like uh, uh, EVs flow through circulation, but possibly also through the lymph node. Now, other uh, routes of injection may also include like intranasal. And these are very uh, possible types or routes of EV administration as well. And um, hopefully after this work, we're also hoping to uh, tackle on that uh, types of routes and possibly found, find other ways or results of how by distribution is affected by those routes. But there have been papers already that I think they use dyes to try the different administration routes and they found different biodistribution. So I, I would tend to think, yeah, the, the body will change. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how you administer them, yeah. Because mm. uh, they, they should... did a similar study with uh, lipid, mm -hmm. liposomes and stuff like that, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But shouldn't the retroorbital injection and the pain vein injection, shouldn't be that be similar? Because both are IV, like intravenous? Hmm, Ken, what do you think? I'm not a medical doctor, but I recall the circulation. My very, again, I, I cannot give you a definitive answer on that. It... I recall reading somewhere they might differ a little, but I could be wrong. Yeah, but we have not tried basically as a short answer to that. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Thank you. Yeah, I have one more question. One, um, did you guys try to perform like a size exclusion chromatography on your uh, like mm -hmm. up concentrated condition media? But I think you already mentioned mm -hmm. that you, you the filtration uh, already uh, loses a lot of uh, other vesicles also. So, so I'm not uh, because we also tried. Uh, uh, the size exclusion chromatography on a condition media and the profile that we get from the cell culture media and the profile that we get from the plasma, uh, mouse plasma, it's totally different. So we're just wondering like uh, whether we are losing the uh, small EVs in the later protein fractions or is it something that you have already tried and looked for? So we're just wondering that. Yes. So again, like two, two factors. One is like for, for in vivo experiments, it's very, very hard to get enough EV samples for animal experiments. And hence, like uh, this would actually dictate your, your uh, uh, isolation protocols. But to answer your question, we, uh, in this experiment, we didn't do any uh, other purifications aside from the PBS washing. But uh, however, in, in the subsequent experiments after this work, we have tried SEC and found that although it, it purifies the uh, isolated EVs with uh, other free, uh, free floating proteins and lipo, uh, lipoproteins possibly, um, we, uh, it is still hard <laughs> to distinctly separate uh, SEVs and uh, BEVs uh, distinctly, uh, mainly because the, the size difference is still very minute. Uh, if we were to like just uh, go from a size range of about like 50 nanometers to 800 nanometers in size. Now, this was only uh, using a commercial SEC column, but uh, other uh, instruments possibly with an actual HPLC coupled with SEC um, may um, explore this phenomena better, as well as using possible AF4 or TFF uh, instruments, but we have not tried that yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So next up is Tanina Arab, who has a series of questions. You've written a book here, Tanina. <laughs> I was thinking about them as the, the presentation was going. Very nice presentation. And indeed, I got thank inspired. You. I'm sorry. No, um, no. The questions are good. <laughs> Let me read that um, <laughs> So I had a couple of questions regarding the EV toxicity uh, and the experiment around that. Uh, and I was wondering if you have seen in the animals that have been injected with the EVs that were toxic, a correlation between uh, the weight of the animals and the dose that have been received. And if like you draw any conclusion or it was a universal response uh, towards mm -hmm. the 100 micrograms, I mean, above 50 micrograms of uh, injected EVs. Okay, so um, let me uh, guide the experiment again. So for, for the initial lethality results, um, so basically we uh, just injected uh, a bolus injection and then um, uh, observed after 24 hours. So basically the animal weight was not a part of the uh, things that we varied on this experiment and hence we didn't actually study on that. And but we, what we found as an acute uh, uh, phenotype was that the animals right after injection, especially those injected with 50 to 100 uh, uh, microgram of EVs, both PV or SEV, like did uh, show uh, signs of asphyxia, mainly like choking type of uh, phenotype, uh, which again, uh, we dare not say could be attributed to a single factor such as maybe the dye or the dose. Uh, the dose. But uh, we suggest or we imply uh, possibly that this could be a factor for both um, cell type, such as um, other disease models tend to be more sticky when isolated. Now, I mean, we, we've isolated from normal cells such as hec 29 gt and we saw that the, the EVs were easily uh, suspended in PBS. Well, 41 SEVs and uh, BEVs once uh, in a concentrated um, uh, manner tend to be more sticky. And, this could contribute to uh, any acute um, uh, phenotype, which we are still uh, uh, need to confirm in the future experiments. Now, with regards to animal weight, though, we, we did our, our uh, tumor bearing mice model uh, in a succession of experiments for up to three weeks. And then we found, uh, but in here, we only used 10 microgram uh, injections uh, three times a day, uh, three times per week for up to three weeks. And then we found that actually, um, 
the animals when once injected with uh, the scramble or scramble EVs did lose a lot of weight over its time. And um, yeah. yeah. Do you have any speculation and, about that? <laughs> well, it could be a lot of things, possibly because like an uh, immune response is too busy finding, uh, fighting like other uh, the, the, the disease progression or whatever, or it could, it could be actually a phenotype of the tumor itself. But what we found is that when we knocked down CD44, the animal weight loss was not as significant as that given off by the scramble injected mice. So possibly the CD44 also attenuated the phenotype which is related to the loss of animal weight. Well, actually, my, my question was related to the very first um, data that you shared uh, mm -hmm. when you were trying to establish, actually, the toxicity and the concentration mm -hmm. of EVs, even before uh, this biological, yeah, this one. So mm -hmm. uh, even before the biological question itself, but you, you cover it very nicely. So thank you so much for the details. Thank you. And in the same theme, have you seen any sex-based differences or all those mice were male or all of them were female all, um, uh, all the mice we used were female were female okay yes okay so that's something perhaps to to investigate uh next know, to yeah. see if like the phenotype um i mean if you see any difference um and uh, speaking of toxicity um and the acute response that you are mentioning uh have you done any on the toxin essay prior to injections uh, to establish the ontotoxin level in the EVs, um, just to be in the safe zone of that? Mm, well, uh, that is a very good suggestion. But however, for this work, uh, we did not uh, do that particular uh, experiment, but it, it is a good suggestion and we could apply that to future work. Awesome. But we do well, test our cell lines regularly uh, for contaminations. We're quite sure, because one thing that we do know is that if we have contamination, our reporter would go down because they are affected by mycoplasma. So we try our best to keep them clean. But again, a very good suggestion on the endotoxin. And one more thing, if I may uh, clarify, because we've been asked by the reviewers that why we did not do escalating dosages to test the lethality. I the, promise the I was not a reviewer. I promise. No, no, <laughs> it's okay. But we, we wanted to clarify this is that. The experiment was initially designed to uh, image the BioD under IVIS um, at reported um, dosage, uh, doses. And 100 microgram was actually something that we had to try because the DIR dye, we realized without such a high dose, we could not uh, detect it. But that's when we started seeing that. So basically what we did is that we have like four or five people line up doing simultaneous injection to inject the different doses. And then we were ready to put the animals onto the IVIS table for imaging. And some of them started suffering. And that's when we realized that, oh my goodness, like how could they be dying? And so the initial design of the experiment was not to test the lethality of the vesicle doses. So this again was um, an observation by chance. Yeah, but I thought, um, and we thought it's important to raise this um, awareness to the people that uh, don't just try to push your signal, <laughs> see how your animals are doing. And I think what you observe with the weight loss uh, and the, the gender uh, potential difference, I think those are very important points that uh, people can look into. Mm -hmm. And if I may, uh, like just add a comment for the endotoxin um, uh, suggestion, um, you may have yourselves in a very clean, um, uh, I mean, incubator and culture under the hood, which is a sterile conditions, but usually EV isolation is done at the bench and um, you, you are do doing UC and then you suspend your pellet. I assume that all of this is at the bench and um, endotoxin can be really everywhere. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. through checking the FDA approval uh, concentration, those are actually very low. So, um, one can be surprised to find the concentration uh, high in EV uh, final preparation just because of mm -hmm. all the steps that we have in the protocol that are done outside of the hood. I think that's a really good point. I think we should try next time. But yeah. we, we also did wash. I, I mean, okay, I'm sure like it's not perfect, but we do do washes after our prep. So hopefully that will remove a lot of endotoxin if there's a lot of presence of that. But again, I, I, I really take your suggestion on that one. And I think we may do some tests to see um, the endotoxin potential uh, in, in our prep. Um, but, but we do very thorough watch 
to to rid of uh, initially to rid of uh, protein contaminants. Yeah, but then again, I'll look into that that test kit. Yeah. Awesome. Then I had a yeah, question great. here uh, about the timeline of the injection, but you just answered it that some of the animals died right after the first injection, so it doesn't have uh, to do with the the close timeline of the repeated the repeated injection, but actually even the first one was a little. So thank you so much. They're very exciting. Yeah, thank, you so much. thank you so much. Yeah, those are great suggestions. We'll look into that. Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank you. Taral, did you have another question? I saw your hand was up for a second there. Yeah, I had, but uh, I think Tanina asked that question already. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, we have come exactly to the end of our hour, and it's been a very interesting and informative hour for me. Um, so thank you so much, Brian, and thank you so much, Charles, for joining us. Um, looking forward to uh, seeing this out in print and, and, and where it goes from here. So, so good luck with the reviews. And um, we, we hope to hear more of this story soon. So, uh, so, so thanks again, Thank everybody, so for joining. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you all at a, another EV Club event very soon. Thank okay. you so much. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Thank you Brian. Thank you. Bye.